Hello, comrades. Today, in English class, we discussed how Upton Sinclair's The Jungle leads to socialist paradise. We will do this by describing three forms of morality, and then discuss the difference between competition and cooperation. Let's go, comrade. Throughout The Jungle, Upton Sinclair has pushed us to consider the extremes of moral dilemmas. We see how Jurgis has sought to continue in the moral traditions and norms that he found in his upbringing in Lithuania. However, through the predations of the Chicago meatpacking industry, the society created by these economic conditions, his commitment to those moral principles soon evaporates, and by the time we see him emerging back from his time as a tramp, coming out of his work for a political machine, he connects with Maria, who has also found that abandoning her moral principles was the only way to survive, in her case, through taking up a life of prostitution. In fact, she argues, and others seem to follow suit, that this is the only reasonable alternative to starvation and death. So today we're going to look at your sources of morality, and I'm going to describe basically three ways to uh, put together a sense of a moral system. And I'll say this, these are very simplified, and in the worlds of ethics and morality there's so much more to say, but this gives us at least a framework of alternatives. The first is called deontological morality, and I'll explain a little more what that means. Virtue morality and constructed morality. Again, these are terms that I'm kind of using to describe bigger traditions. So deontological morality is the first, and this has the idea that moral principles are absolute, universal, and immutable. You can see here the picture is Moses bringing Ten Commandments, and so the Judeo-Christian tradition very much holds to this idea in which moral principles are created by the creator of the world and that they are embedded in the fabric of reality itself. Therefore, they cannot be altered, and to go against them means to resist the nature of being itself and to incur cosmic consequences. So if you want to see it broken down, it's revealed by divine revelation, usually aided by evident reason. If you think about the defense that Martin Luther gave before the Roman Catholic officials, he said that he wouldn't change his position unless he could be shown by scripture and reason how he was wrong. So you can see him following a deontological moral system. This system argues that moral principles can be understood and sensed by humans. Especially you, come, you get from this the idea of a conscience almost like a sixth sense, so your eyes are capable of detecting the presence of light, your ears, the presence of sound, and so forth. And there's this moral faculty that has the ability to detect moral qualities that are in the nature of reality, and then make you feel good or bad as a way to help guide you towards the right moral action, if you are behaving well. And from this starting point, you come to the conclusion that moral activity or morality is never altered by circumstances, and as I said before, violations of moral rules will incur cosmic consequences. So at no point do circumstances justify, you know, taking away from some moral standard. Now you all, you see this here with the, in the image here, you know, justice is blind, so the idea is that she is applying universal standards without consideration to circumstances. Or like, well, in your case, I'd make this, nope, she makes no exceptions. So the next sort of category or tradition, which has some overlap with the first, is the idea of virtue morality, where we focus more on the idea that virtue can be seen as a normative guide to promote human thriving to the extent that it can be followed. The image here is from the School of Athens, Plato and Aristotle. 
What does this tradition sort of break down to suggest? So first of all, moral principles here, the emphasis is much more on them being discerned by reason. So people in this tradition do not necessarily look for divine revelation. Uh, the image here is Benjamin Franklin, who really was all about moral perfection through reason. He was more of a deist. It's, he believed that there was a God, but he wasn't really focused on divine revelation as much as what he could work out by his senses and through reason. So moral principles are confirmed by experience and make sense in terms of outcomes in the world. So you're not looking to satisfy a cosmic standard or cosmic justice, but you're trying to find what rational patterns built into the way the world works lead to thriving and cultivating virtue is a way to do this. So moral action is seen as the best way to achieve human thriving. And there's this sense in this tradition, if you look at uh, Aristotle's ethics for instance, he argues that the state should promote virtue in the citizens. In fact that's what he would argue is a chief goal of the state or at the very least as Franklin and the other founding fathers would suggest the state should provide an environment in which human virtue can thrive. Finally, we have this Marxist sense. He might not be the only one uh, who has this idea, but he applied it in a very influential way, which says that moral principles are really only social strategies adapted to further the interests of certain groups or individuals. In his mind, he, he saw the world break down into economic classes, and so he thought of morality as being something that people invent to try to project power. So if you are the owner of a factory and you have a lot of capital invested in that factory, and it really is going to work best for you if the workers believe that stealing is wrong, that hard work and punctuality is morally right, then you are going to continue to support a moral system that has these as moral principles. And so his argument was that a lot of things that Western capitalists had regarded as moral principles were really just a system to control workers and help them to continue to serve the capitalists without question. And he suggested then that if you want to see the source of morality, it's really who has power interests. So if you break down this approach, morality isn't something that's revealed by a deity. And it's not really evident by the nature, like some sort of underlying nature of reality or reason, but it's really found as an outgrowth of ideology. So if you are, uh, have an ideology based on capitalism, your morality will suit that. If you are looking at a communist ideology, then your morality will be based on the interests of communism. So morality serves ideology. It's constructed by it. This means then, as I said, morality is the projection of power and it's used to maintain power. Moral statements are to be understood in this way. In this sense, there really is no knowable moral absolute. Morals serve power or ideology. Finally, when power is taken from one group by another, and in Marxist theory that often means a violent upheaval, then the morality will change. So there are no fixed principles, but principles of morality are simply reflections of power dynamics and that they can change when those who hold power change. This now gets to our discussion item. If you were faced with the imminent starvation that was described in the jungle, what would you do? This is not an uncommon predicament even today, and it was certainly widespread even in wealthy nations 100 and 150 years ago. So in the book, when Jurgis reconnects with Maria and sees that she has 
adopted a lifestyle as a prostitute and financially is much better off. Certainly by the standards of traditional morality, she is a completely fallen woman. Jurgis tells her about his experiences, including how he had been thrown in prison twice as a result of him seeking to fight with Connor, who had sought to seduce his wife. Maria, with a new sense of practical morality, if you call it that, says that you were a fool to make that an issue. Of course, you should have sold the virtue of your wife and lived by it. This was an obvious choice for her. Why would you risk this death in, uh, through starvation of you and your family because you have a little hang-up about adultery? This represents a very different approach to morality, but what would you do if you were faced with a life-and-death situation? Is there a moral case to make for people choosing things to avoid the death of others in particular, especially when there isn't harm to a third party, or at least not harm that they aren't also willingly choosing? Or, in some cases, is it worth harming somebody else a little bit to save the life of one of your family members? Would it be worth, for instance, stealing bread to keep your son or daughter from starving to death? Are there exceptions to certain moral rules, like thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false testimony? Let's see what you think. The final theme we're looking at today is the difference between competition and cooperation. At the very end of this novel, Jurgis meets some socialist characters who began to explain a very different way of looking at the world, a way which radically rejects the competition-based capitalist system that prevails in Packingtown in Chicago. He describes the challenge faced by the working class who collectively have perhaps more power than the few industrialists, yet because they are so disunited and because the industrialists work so effectively at keeping them disunited, they are always at a disadvantage when it comes to bargaining or any sort of real or political power. And so the idea is, could these unite and in that way achieve greater justice for them and their families in the newly industrialized world? So competition versus cooperation. You have this idea also that humans could thrive in the right environment and that perhaps the environment of competition, as it is predatory and exploitative, is not the right environment for human thriving. Rather, might human thriving be accomplished better through a system founded on cooperation? So not a system in which the winner takes all and the losers thrive as they may, or in many cases starve, or serve the needs or the whims of the winner at great cost to themselves. Rather than that, what if a system was based around using resources to meet needs, caring for all, making sure that everyone was able to keep up, be maintained? Would that lead, and, you know, and, and that way there would be, in a sense, less wastage. Everybody was able to contribute fully what they can instead of some being wiped out through loss of competition. So there's this idea that if we could just change the environment of humans and their society, we might see thriving rather than death and despair. This then gives the argument, or at least the platform, for viewing the future in a way that looks for radical change in society 
to produce human virtue and thriving. Again, especially with that second idea of virtue morality, where the goal of the state ought to be to promote virtue in the citizens and in the people, you can see a nice argument maybe being made here that if we just order the state differently, order society diff differently, we would then produce the opportunity for people to act virtuously. Again, Maria would never have turned to prostitution if she had had other, more viable ways of providing for herself and for her family. And so if you take away this desperation, moral activity then becomes possible and people will automatically prefer it and pursue it. In the context of Sinclair around the turn of the century, we see the rise of a socialist party in the United States. It was the early, earliest 20, early 20th century that saw basically the high watermark of socialism in the United States as far as socialist parties winning more and more representation even at a federal level. Now at no point did they represent anything like a major dominant party influence, but they never have come farther than they did around the turn of the century. After the World Wars, there was the brand had kind of been tarnished in a lot of ways in the Americans' eyes. Upton Sinclair wrote this story specifically to promote the political goals of the Socialist Party. And here you can see one of their posters with the slogan, Workers of the World Unite, right, in a presidential campaign. And in the American context, Sinclair is looking to use the industrial technology that we now have in the United States cooperatively to promote social virtue and prosperity for all. They look around and they say, look, there is so much production capable now that we have things like the steam engine, factories, right? There is no want of meat to eat in Chicago. The problem is that because of the perverse incentives created by a market system based on competition, the meat is degraded and people go hungry, right? So there's this mismatch. Needs are there, resources readily available, but because of the way the system is set up, the food doesn't get to the hungry, and people effectively don't have freedom to thrive and be virtuous. So this was the, the hope, that this could be changed if we would just readjust in, in fairly radical ways, um, but it would make a huge difference and benefit so many people. Comrades, please read discussion assignment information carefully as you cooperate to complete your homework. In the United States, you can always find party, but in English class, party always find you. <laughs> please. Enjoy Communist International as you join Socialist Paradise. Dos Vadonia. Arise, you prisoners of salvation. Arise, you wretched of the earth. For justice thunders condemnation. For better worlds in birth. No more traditions change your mind. Arise, you slaves, no more in thrall. The earth shall rise a new foundation. We have been locked, we shall be all. Tis the final conflict. Let each stand in his place. The international Soviet shall be the human race. Tis the final We must decide and do 